assume that people know what the protocols are um, and we will, um, as usual, raise hands um, uh, in order to make yourself known to me and I'll then bring you in. Um, particular welcome to Steve Bramwell, um, who is going to be talking about the Black Owl Men Shed uh, in a few moments. Can I um, ask if there are any apologies for absence? I don't think there are. Um, any declarations of interest? Craig? Nope. I don't think I have. Pretty long. No, uh, and I don't think I have either. Right. Okay, in that case, let's go on to agenda uh, item three, which is the area performance summary from the police. And uh, Richard Ross is here to give us a brief presentation. Richard, over to you. Thanks, Jersey. I know you've all got a copy of this report, so I'll just sort of highlight some of the, the main points. So, um, the first section is uh, obviously in relation to road safety and road crime. Um, probably what's most notable is there has been an increase in drinking drug drivers over the, the time period. Uh, but I would say is that, um, obviously, with the change to legislation a couple of years ago and the uh, increased equipment we have to detect drug driving, that accounts for the, the rise compared to the five and three year averages. Um, so it's, it's down to a more proactive approach. Um, so the number of speeding offences has dropped um, and the people driving while using a mobile phone has stayed static over the time period. And again, with seatbelt offences dropping. Um, probably in relation to our prevention, what I'd like to highlight is uh, the work in relation to the NC500 and visitor management this year. And there's been a lot of work done in the relation to multi-agency work um, to deal with the, the many issues caused by visitors, of which road safety and road crime is just one. Of them. So the um, intention is for that group, the multi-agency group, to continue next year and planning's already in, in place for that. Um, so, so that, that's going to be highlight highly for the uh, road safety section. In terms of serious and organised crime, um, there's been one misuse of drugs warrant executed in the time period. That's an ongoing inquiry, so I won't go too much into that if that's okay. Um, but it was quite a successful warrant, which some of you may be aware of. Um, for acquisitive crime, uh, there's been a substantial drop in the number of theft by housebreaking. It's dropped from 11 the previous year to two this year. So, um, it's a substantial drop and shoplifting has increased, but based on the year previously when a lot of shops were closed, it's, it's no major surprise to see, see shoplifting increasing slightly. Um, theft of motor vehicles is down by two and theft from motor vehicles is down by six. So if we continue with our uh, prevention work in terms of uh, acquisitive crime, and there's a lot of social media messaging goes out in relation to um, crimes of dishonesty. Um, for antisocial behaviour, uh, again, unsurprisingly, there's been a, a large increase in the number of licensed premises checks carried out uh, compared to last year when most pubs were closed for the majority of the time. That's where we put a particular focus on is checking the licensed premises. Uh, we try to be in there regular to support the staff in the, the premises and to deal with any issues before they for the escalate. Um, in terms of uh, sub, uh, drugs offences, there's been an increase of nine in, compared to last year. Uh, disorders, uh, there's just been a slight rise in terms of breach of the peace or threat and abusive behaviour, just a slight rise of two. Um, and again, staying fairly, fairly stark, just slightly below the three and five year averages. Uh, been quite a significant drop in assaults on emergency services workers um, over that time period um, and see vandalisms itself have, have also stayed fairly static. Now, stop and search is a tactic we do use in the area. There's been 30 stop and searches carried out of which 14 were positive searches. Um, so again a near 50% success rate. Then moving on to protecting vulnerable people in terms of class two sexual crimes, 
there's been a drop of four compared to the previous year. Uh, and it is worth noting that these figures um, include historical fin offences, which are reported to us at the time. It's, it's based on the time reported rather than when the offence actually happened for statistical purposes. And so a, a number of these offences are historical in nature. Um, Blue Note has taken a lot of our time as missing people. And you know that there's been, in the time period of this report, there's been 95 reports of missing persons in our uh, area. Um, obviously, there's a wide variety of reasons why that happens. Uh, what we do have is we've now got police liaison officers working directly with each of the uh, care homes for children in the area, trying to reduce the incidence of the people going missing. So that's a bit of an ongoing work to build up that relationship with the care home staff and also the, the residents as well to, to try and reduce the incidence of people going missing. But so that is uh, 95 in that time period. Um, other than that, there's nothing else I would particularly wish to, to, to raise, but obviously I'm open for, for any questions you would like to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, very much. Um, Craig. Yeah, thank you, Commander. Um, I hope I've not promoted you. <laughs> um, you have, I think. <laughs> oh, right. No, it's very, I mean, obviously over the years, as a council, we see lots of uh, reports come to us. And one of the things that struck me now is the reduction in people of using uh, speeding mobile phones and seat belts perhaps the message is actually getting through to people that it's not it's not worth the bother really and for your own people's own safety to do that they're being more vigilant in their driving um, obviously noting some of your comments through the report but the one that I found quite significant was the uh, detection rate for assaults on emergency workers. Now, I find that quite a heinous, um, egregious, if, you, if even going that far, that people would actually assault emergency workers. They're trying to help people at the end of the day. And the fact that you've got such a high detection rate would mean to me that these some of these people are obviously known to the emergency workers or your, uh, your officers are there to intervene at a very early age. Uh, age, sorry, uh, very early time. So as I said, th there's a lot of positives in here and, and from what you're saying there, you're obviously working on the areas that you need to work on. So I welcome what you've, what you've produced for, for this, uh, which is a new committee. And I don't think overall the Black Isle is a hotbed of crime, but I think with the vigilance that you and your officers are putting in, we can get an even better picture for the future. Thanks, Craig. Um, I might just add, um, Richard, uh, yeah, the, um, I would endorse what Craig says. Um, 95 inquiries on missing people, though. I mean, that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a thought. I assume that most of these people, or all of these people were traced without too much difficulty, or are, are many of them still missing? Hey, no, no uh, in terms of how we have no outstanding missing people in the area at the moment. Uh, so they, they've all been traced, um, and a lot. I say a lot of these are traced fairly quickly. Uh, yeah. You know, compared to sort of long-running missing person inquiries, uh, but that that is the number. So it shows the scale of the the work that that does go into missing people reports in the in that time period. But yeah, at the moment we have no outstanding missing people in the in the area. Yeah, no, I mean it takes up a lot of your time, I'm sure. Um, the other the other thing I was going to inquire about, which I don't think you've got any stats on, is um, online um, scams, which I know is a matter of considerable concern uh, to, 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 to many of the folk in this ward. Um, a lot of them are, are elderly, as you know, and they're a particular target. Um, can, can you tell us anything about that, whether or not the incidence is, 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 has raised over the last um, number of months? Yeah, so what is um, in terms of online scams, whether that be by internet or telephone calls, um, yeah, the the regular occurrence, um, the the va 
pretty much the vast majority are perpetrated from out with this area. Uh, you know, the victims within the area, but they've contacted from out with on many occasions from out with the UK. Um, you know, in terms of has it increased, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but we did see an increase when uh, lockdown started as the uh, uh, organised criminals moved from one crime type to another and scams scams increased. Uh, I'd say it's, it's a near daily occurrence for us to get a report of somebody having been scammed uh, and some of the, the money's lost would be eye-watering, to be honest, the, um, the scale of scale of the loss to people. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of preventive work on. We've uh, just recently, there's been an input to community councils. Um, I think there's maybe one offered to councillors as well. I'm not sure has that taken place yet. Um, but we look to get the message out there. Um, problem is the, the exact method of how these scams are perpetrated changes so regular. Um, it's it's very difficult to keep up with them, but we, we do try and get messages out regularly. Okay. I'm wondering whether it would be useful, I think it probably would be, if we could have a, a sort of um, record of, of the number of these such instances that are reported on the Black Isle in future reports. If it's possible for you to produce these figures, I think that would be interesting, because I know this is a topic of concern to our, to, to, to our constituents. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to the unit that produced the report and see what we can get. And if not, in the report, I'm sure I'll be able to get something to you for for your information for the councillors, maybe separate to the report. OK, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, I think, has joined us, Councillor Jennifer Barclay. Uh, Je Jennifer, do you have any um, questions uh, for uh, Inspector Ross? Uh, Jennifer? Uh, perhaps she's not there. OK, well, thank you very much indeed, Richard. That's um, um, really overall a pretty positive picture. It's good to see that uh, speeding is down. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a good sign. Um, and um, yeah, uh, thank you and your officers for all the work that you continue to do. And um, we look forward to speaking to you or one of your colleagues in three months' time. That's good. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Right, uh, the next item is um, a presentation by Steve Bramble on the Black Isle Men's Shed. Uh, Steve, I think you've got some slides to share with us. Yes, now I'm hoping that you might see my screen now. Uh, I can, yes, that's great. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, that's the first technology um, uh, triumph today. Let's just go to the full Monty, can we? Okay. Um, oh, it'll do like that, won't it, really? That's, no, that's pretty, uh, that's oh, pretty good, I'll actually. I'll share because... them for you. Oh, okay. I'll share them for you, Steve, so it's mine you're seeing, I think. Oh, is that right? Okay. Oh, <laughs> okay so you just, just tell me when you want oh. the next slide. <laughs> All right. That's great. Well, I better get out of this screen then because I'm looking at my own one here. Anyway, I'll just use it as a prompt. That's great. Well, this is like, thank you so much for inviting me along today. Um, this arose out of uh, a presentation I gave to the Black Isle um, Cares uh, AGM, where Di was there, and uh, she contacted me afterwards. And it was uh, it was really nice to speak to her and to Kai uh, and get some advice about uh, about this project that we've set up. Um, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Black Isle Men's Shed, have been for about three years, and as you'll imagine, uh, the shed itself has uh, had to lock down, and we've tried to keep things going with various initiatives, including Zoom meetings and things, but we're very much now in a resetting up phase and trying to retrieve some of our members who've disappeared over those past two years uh, to other activities or got out of the way of uh, going to the shed. However, there's been a sort of core of very uh, active uh, shed members, uh, most of us on the committee uh, that set the shed up. And uh, we've been thinking of ways in which we can benefit and work with the communities. Um, uh, and we came up with this idea. Um, so uh, we, um, let's see now, uh, that's great. Have you just changed that, um, Alison? Have you changed the slide? 
No, sorry, I haven't. If you want the next slide. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to come out of out of this if I possibly can. Um, uh, and come back to. You're on yeah. the second slide now. Right. OK, could you just go back to the first slide uh, to begin with? So I'm just a bit more orientated. Oh, I'm back. Right. OK, so um, what this was, was a, a few of us who got together to wonder what we could do to uh, improve the quality of life of some of our less able members in the community. Um, and uh, we, uh, a year on from our uh, initial planning, uh, we're nearly ready to go. Uh, we've almost raised enough funds to start the service. Um, and uh, you can see a, a gathering here where we were uh, being handed over our first trike that we'd raised funds for. And uh, it gives you a sort of idea of, uh, of what we do. Um, that's Gavin, who's the headmaster of the of, uh, Fort Rose Academy with whom we're working. That's Leslie, who's our powerhouse, who organizes all the training. There's Carola, whose parents are um, being uh, enjoying being in the tri shop. And that there is a resident from the care home called Billy, after whom the first tri shop has been named. Uh, and it's called Billy Whiz, which is a an ironic name since they don't go more than five miles an hour. Um, the rest of the people in here, uh, uh, a lady from the care home who's the, the social organiser, and in the right there, who you'll see more of, is Alan McCaffrey, our uh, chapter captain. So next slide, please. So who are we and what are we? Um, it came to me that they, uh, uh, there was a new care home being built in Fort Rose and that it would be nice to do something uh, for the residents who often get a little bit locked in uh, to, uh, to the environment. And uh, we wondered what we as a men's shed could perhaps do to help. And uh, we gave it some considerable thought and then we realized that this really wasn't a totally a men's shed uh, project, but it was something that really should be led and based by uh, led by and based in the community uh, of the two towns for Trozen and Rose Markey. And uh, that uh, we decided to um, uh, to form this group to uh, obtain two mobility trishaw taxis so that we could get volunteers to take people out to local beauty spots, get them out and about. Um, and uh, do this without cost to them and see if we could benefit them just as other groups in the uh, in the area have done. Um, we know that this uh, exercise is great because it helps to combat social isolation and immobility issues. Um, and in fact, uh, this uh, picture just shows me taking uh, my sister-in-law and her daughter, both of whom have severe problems, and also a cat that just happened to join us at the day, on the day, um, uh, taking them out for a ride. And uh, they, they particularly enjoyed this because both of them would not have got to the places we got to otherwise. We went out to the point. And uh, the other thing is that um, we wanted to provide volunteer um, opportunities uh, in the local community because we, many of us have experienced the benefits of volunteering, and we felt that this would be a very good thing that might help to strengthen the community spirits uh, within two areas which have, have had a remarkable growth in the number of people. Um, but within Fort Rose and Rose Markey, there has been a limited opportunity for these people to take part in their community. And I think that unless we help to promote um, uh, a community spirit and um, uh, shall we say, uh, help people to join in activities like this, then there's a danger that it just becomes a sleepy commuter area and we lose this wonderful opportunity uh, to help other people. And finally, we realised uh, with our intergenerational work that we've done in the shed previously with the Och Primary School, that involving um, pupils, perhaps senior pupils in Portrait's Academy, uh, um, would be a good idea. So you can see that there's a raft of good ideas there. Uh, if we go on to the next slide. Yeah. 
yeah. And so this really just shows you the sort of time scale of what we've been doing since last November. So this started off as an idea of ourselves, for ourselves. Um, uh, we the next step was to get a, was to do our research to see how the community would um, would uh, accept this sort of initiative. So we got a loan of tr of a trike for our, from Mick Heath from Spokes for Folks in Inverness, and um, we uh, started to uh, talk to uh, Cycling Without Age Scotland, which is very much a parent um, uh, uh, charity, uh, which is encouraged by the government to help. Uh, other groups set up, so we started our links with them. We formed um, uh, an aptly named steering group in February 2021, and uh, I'll go into the details of that steering group just in a wee second. Um, we became a chapter of uh, Cycling Without Age Scotland uh, with our own constitution and affiliated to them so that we are protected by their charitable status in March of this year. Uh, and they, our link with them gives us insurance through them. They give us training, they help us with maintenance and general support and advice. And so we found that this is a very, uh, a very useful way of helping us get off the ground. What could BIMS do, uh, our Black Isle Men's Shed, what could we do to try and help this? Well, as a new uh, sort of setting up uh, organization, uh, getting banking facilities to take in um, uh, 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 donations and things uh, is it's actually very difficult to set up and it can take months and months to get a bank account set up as you're probably aware if you've been involved in this sort of activity. So what we felt was that we could provide people with banking support, they could use our bank account to put money into um, they could use our web page for a, web, a, a sort of link to uh, encourage people to donate and to publicise. And also for the first six months or so of the activity, we took them under our wing and covered them uh, with insurance until the insurance was taken over by Cycling Without Age Scotland. So we were able to ensure that we could uh, carry on and accrue funds through fundraising by helping with this. And I think that's quite a nice model. Uh, uh, that other groups might might uh, take up. We had a fundraising target of £19,000, and these trikes are not inexpensive. Uh, they come from Denmark, they have to come through the parent charity uh, who get them at a, a reasonable price, um, and they're electric trikes uh, with a lots of, lots of uh, power in them so that they're ideal for going up hills in Fort Rose. And so we needed two of those, but we also thought that we would be best to try and get a trailer so that we can take, uh, we can recover trikes that break down if we need to, but more importantly, to try and take the trikes out to other communities so that they can, uh, other communities can benefit from the service and perhaps be inspired or encouraged to set their own up. And actually, as we speak, our trike is on its trailer on the way to Och where a lady is interested in setting up a service, and we're going to give free rides and all today. So it's it's very much uh, useful uh, to do that. And then we had to plan how to run the service uh, as well. Okay, next slide, please. Okay. So making it happen um, uh, here again is uh, this is Alan McCaffrey. He's our, our team captain. Another view of the tri shaw, which is effectively, as you can see, just a chap uh, on an electric trike behind and a nice box here uh, with a comfy seat. Uh, and there's actually a, a, a nice uh, sort of warm uh, fleecy blanket that goes over there uh, for two people to sit in. OK. So we have eight people on our steering group, and that's a spectrum of people. We've got three folks from our, who are BIMS trustees. Uh, we've got Susie Walker, we've got uh, the, our care home uh, the social organiser, and Alan McCaffrey, who's a psycho mechanic, but uh, some of you may know him as a retired policeman. And we have two other people with great um, uh, uh, experience in volunteering within the community, and that's proved to be a really dynamic group of people. Um, uh, 
we have become a chapter of um, Cycling Without Age Scotland, um, and we're trustees of that. Um, our set, we set about uh, fundraising. I've taken the lead in applying for grants, but we've had funds from various different people. We've been very fortunate to get a fund from Baxter, the George and Ina Baxter Foundation, and that was good because we had previously, through BIMS, had got money from them, so they knew us. And when I applied again, they were aware of what we were able to do. And that connection probably helped to secure the grant. Uh, we've been, um, become a co-op uh, uh, sponsored group over the next year, which will help us with our ongoing running costs. But we've been helped by local firms. We've had a, a, a nice donation from the uh, Rosemark Amenities Group. People have raised personal, sent personal donations, which they've gift dated in some cases. And perhaps our, our best uh, fundraising are these two here, which one was Alan's epic ride, where this chap got on his bike and cycled up and down the Black Isle until he had uh, cycled the height of uh, Everest um, and raised somewhere in the region of about £4,000 in sponsorship, which was fantastic. And then we had the, the old gentleman's golf competition in, uh, uh, recently, which raised over £400, including £200 for a bowl that had been turned by one of our members uh, and donated for the comp for the uh, the fund, and we've been out to this is us going over to Wildwoods to try and publicise things, and we got quite a lot of money from that. We're actively engaged in training volunteer pilots, and uh, um, we we aim to have twenty. We're nearly up there now, so we're just about ready to do that, and we've been able to uh, have some good publicity publicity by taking the trikes about town uh, through the Rothschild Journal, who've been really supportive, um, and other groups, including Black Isle Cares, Black Isle Notice Board, etc. Next slide, please. So where we are now, uh, very uh, briefly, we're about £1,500 short of our last, um, uh, a, a, the second trike purchase, in which at which stage our funding exercise will be completed uh, in terms of setup. Uh, we have um, uh, one trike and the trailer. We have our uh, we have ongoing um, uh, pilot training. We've looked at most of the routes. Some we've found are, are suitable. Others we have to take very light passengers only because the road down to the harbour at Fort Rose is quite a, a difficult one to get back from. But by and large, we're doing pretty well. And we started doing rides, particularly through the care home, where they have uh, the ability to do social distancing, which is much easier. And we're now reaching out to the various different groups who could help us find the people who might benefit most from this. So uh, next slide, please. I think we're just about there. Now, Alison, I don't know whether you could play the... Uh, yeah, that's the that I think we'll do for the last slide. Um, have you got the link to the video you can play? What this was was um, a video which was made by uh, one of the children of the trustees who's at Fortress Academy, and he enjoys making videos. So we made a promotional video there, which just gives you an essence of what uh, uh, of um, how this works. I'm sorry, I've tried again, but I can't get into that link. All right. Oh, well, listen, I, I think probably we should just stop there. Um, uh, I'm sorry I haven't been able to show you it. It really was quite, a, quite an uplifting week. But uh, um, I think we're nearly there, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you would like. Well, thank you very much, Steve. That's a great story, I must say, um, and I'm sure it's got enormous value both for um, El the more the older members of society and 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 indeed for the young ones too. Um, I mean, I've got a couple of questions, but um, I'll, I'll bring in Craig first because he's got his hand up. Craig. Thanks very much, Steve. Um, a lot of what you said there makes complete sense. I think the more I research men's sheds, it brings in so much of the community to different areas that may not 
um, have benefited, such as the uh, trishaws that you've got there. We have trishaws in Cromarty, so I, I know the, the benefits of that. But the thing that intrigues me, um, well, it's not intrigues as such, it's the benefit to mental health and mental well-being, because as you get older, there's the people tend to drift into isolation and just to have the the opportunity to be amongst people who can share experience is what the men's sheds are really about and it doesn't matter if you're if you're a lady wanting to use the men's shed at all they're they're across across uh, the board and the amount of wealth of experience that they can bring to communities is, is um, extremely worthwhile. So I'll just leave it as that as observations. They aren't really questions as such. It's just the benefit to particularly mental health in uh, latter life. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there, Steve. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Craig. And you've been a great supporter of us as well. And we do appreciate that mental health um, aspects are absolutely paramount. Um, uh, just the ability, and everyone has these fantastic stories, and one of the most important groups are in fact our, our veterans. And we have a number of old veterans and, and uh, some not so old veterans in the shed, and uh, they're great contributors, but um, you know, you can see they've been through experiences, and uh, I think they have a, we have a great uh, you know, we can have a great chin wag and you can hear their stories and we can tell each other our stories. And that is the, the typical benefit of the shed. Uh, working with other groups is absolutely fantastic. Our, the best thing we've done by far to date has been spending time with the uh, the kids of Oak Primary. Of course, we haven't been able to do that over the lockdown period and uh, recently, but uh, we make toys, flat pack toys, and we go into the classroom and they make them up with us and we run little projects with them. Um, and uh, the members just love that. It's absolutely brilliant. And so we're going to also be involving the Senior Pupils in Fortress Academy for the Saltire Awards, uh, and they'll, some of them will become uh, trike pilots as well. So the, the whole thing is, uh, is just this lovely community spirit that builds through these activities. I was going to ask you about the trike pilots and uh, whether senior Fortress Academy uh, pupils were going to be involved in that. Um, that's that's great, actually. I'm sure that they would absolutely love it. Uh, I take it that they will go some fairly rigorous training before they're allowed loose on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the most difficult thing for a child is going at five miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm but, sure they'd be able to make it go faster than that. I'm quite sure they could. <laughs> I think in their spirit, they would regret it uh, because these things are awfully unstable. <laughs> they, 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 speaking of which, they do not like potholes. So um, uh, we, uh, Leslie uh, warned me in no uncertain terms to say, um, can we can we uh, have the roads a wee bit better? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, um, that's a fair point because that's actually the next the next thing I was going to ask you. Um, I, I cycle a lot, even I have a, a, an electric bike, so I'm, I'm familiar with the roads of the Black Isle. Um, and um, I'm just wondering how you find uh, the roads. Some of them are, are, are pretty busy. Some of them, as you say, are pretty hilly. Um, is it is, is it a concern? Is traffic a concern um, to you? It's, are you it's able to? It's a huge uh, concern, Gordon. Um, this year, uh, we've gone out to Channery Point. Now, you'll know what a mm. nightmare that can mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. but we are we're good. We have an outrider who sort of protects the trike. So the outrider will make sure that we have sufficient space. We will pull in, you know, at the first passing place. The vast majority of people give us a cheery wave and they don't mind. But we do have some idiots that come up and flash and park their horns and would obviously distress passengers if that were the case. But what they maybe don't understand is that if the roads are dodgy at the side, you know, as often they are, and if you look at the, the road along to the cafe at Rose Market, along that, that way, that's just so difficult because we can't pull into the side without kind of toppling over or something like that. So, I mean, that's... Two things I would take from it, yeah, they'd much prefer good quality roads, but secondly, um, 
things like notices and speed limit uh, um, extensions would perhaps be very useful. You know, if we had a sign saying trikes operate in this area, then folk should know that they may not get where they want to go just as fast. Well, it occurs to me that, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the old traffic, the old um, railway track between uh, Och and Fortrose, if, if that were properly surfaced, would be a marvellous route for your trikes. Um, similarly, we are trying to get a, an active travel route between Och and Manlochi, um, which will be also excellent for your trikes. Unfortunately, and deeply regrettably, it's run into some landowner resistance, which is holding up things. Um, but uh, that is the kind of um, facility which I think would give your, your pilots confidence and, and, and I think the old people who you're taking for rides would also give them confidence and the ability to really enjoy some, some lovely countryside and complete safety. And that's, that's an agenda which we are pursuing and um, post COP26 there seems no doubt there's going to be quite a lot more government money into this kind of activity. What we need is a greater cooperation from certain landowners, um, which is frankly a problem right now. Um, we would be delighted about that. Uh, at presently, the, that's a great. The chap who does the maintains the track does a great job. But mm. um, you know, we would need a proper uh, sort of surface there to to safely go. We, we are quite wide. I think we're just over about 1.2 meters wide. Right. So that does uh, it, it means that anything else coming the other way is going to have to have to jump up the bank. <laughs> yeah, yes. Well, well, exactly. As for Channery Point, well, that is another issue altogether. Maybe we should make it a trike only track. <laughs> well, I, I will say that we've been enormously grateful to the chap who was the warden there. Yeah. And uh, the, 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 that he's done a fantastic job under very difficult circumstances. It's been really helpful. He's helped with widening the track so we can get, we can take a quick left out towards the picnic area now uh, with the trikes um, at, at the point and that uh, all these things and uh, controlling traffic. He's done a good job in adverse circumstances, I feel. Well, I, I think it's a, it's a great initiative. Um, the intergenerational aspect too, I think is, 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 is hugely beneficial. Jennifer, I think you're on the call. Is there, is there anything you'd like to say? I can see you there, but I'm not sure if you're able to hear me. Perhaps, perhaps not. But um, anyway, um, Gen Councillor Barclay is, 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 I think, listening in. Um, Craig, yes, uh, another comment. It's just a comment that Steve made there regarding road surface. I would encourage councillors, that's us, to actually be a passenger. I've been a passenger in the one in Cromarty the other year. And you only need an upstand or a downstand, a pothole of about a half, um, half, you say, a couple of centimetres to feel extremely uncomfortable. And some older uh, residents have felt um, sufficiently uncomfortable that they, they, they don't actually like going on it. And it's due to the, the road surface. I know we can't get the road like a billiard table. But the certain areas, especially when you're turning left or right into different roads, uh, I've got one in, in Cromarty at Church Street and um, Forsyth Place. That's not a lot of money to um, uh, resolve just to make that turn, that right or left turn, a lot more smooth for the passenger. And I think Steve, as a, as a pilot, would actually appreciate what I'm saying there. It's this, mm. you only need a, a slight dip or an upstand in a road surface to make a considerable uh, person uncomfortable as a passenger. So that's all I'll say on that one. That's probably for us going to pick up at a later date. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Craig, very much indeed. And thank you, Steve. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, every success to your endeavours um, and I'm happy to say I think that the uh, War Discretionary Fund is going to be contributing towards your target um, and you should hear about that in the next uh, day or two. So anyway, well done. Thank you so well much. Done. Yeah, and, and 
also thank you so much for, for supporting the Black Elm Men's Shed uh, because uh, the, the, the funds that have come through the discretionary fund over the years have made all the difference. So Great. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's good to know. That's really good to know. OK, thank you again for coming. Much appreciated. Bye-bye. Um, right, if we go on to the next agenda item, um, which is the housing performance report, and I think uh, Rory uh, I, is going to um, present this. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, councillors. It's a hard act to follow such a positive story. <laughs> um, but I'll do my best. Um, you've got the um, report in front of you, so I won't read it in exhaustive detail, but I will um, talk about a couple of points on it. Um, you will have heard previously about the impact of COVID on non-emergency repairs. Um, there's a number of factors that are uh, affecting the continued um, extended times it takes to complete non-emergency repairs. During the lockdown period, we focused on emergency repairs, which is why they have maintained their performance. But also there are issues with um, material supply, um, which yeah. are ongoing. And um, we're anticipating that, that, that there is going to be an ongoing impact throughout the year on non-emergency repairs. But we are working through backlogs at the moment. Um, rent arrears has seen a very slight increase, but it's... Um, you know, stayed at um, the similar levels to what it's been over the last um, couple of years, and it is lower than quarter two in the previous year. Um, we're not reporting on the void performance for this committee, um, as we didn't have the the data completely vet, um, vetted by the time the report was due. Um, but we can provide that information at a later committee, if you like, or um, at a void business. Um, for that point, I'll open it up to any questions that members might have. Um, thank you, Roy. Sorry, Craig. Yeah, thanks very much, Rory. Um, it's a very concise report, and a couple of points I pick up pick up on. Um, it's pretty constant compared to um, other timescales. The ones that concern me. Um, there has been a reduction in rent arrears over the quarter to last time round, which is welcome. Um, my concern is the reduction of the £20 per week universal credit. How is that impacting on tenants' ability to pay? Because that's, uh, I don't want to go political, but I'll say this, it's a political choice for that. Um, I know that Highland Council have the money maximisation unit and what interactions does your team have with them? And the other point is contractor availability, because I know from uh, different areas, different uh, council areas, that contractor availability and having approved contractors on our procurement uh, regime, how are you how are you finding that? Uh, to make make it so that you're able to deliver what our tenants expect, because at the end of the day, um, if you're having contract, not being able to get the relative correct contractor for the right job, that's going to have a wider impact on our area. And we, I, I think I'll speak for Gordon as well and, and Jennifer. We want our tenants to be in. Um, as maintenance free properties as we possibly can. Obviously, the, I'm going to be picking up on this um, in the last agenda item, um, but it must be the feedback I'm getting in a, in a, a roundabout way is contractor availability and the correct type of contractor for the jobs that we want them to do um, to deliver the service that you want and our tenants expect. I hope I've articulated that in a, a suitable way for you there, uh, Rory. Yeah, Rory, do you have any response? Yeah, thank you for your questions, Councillor Fraser. Um, yes, so the, I'll start with the rent. The um, We are monitoring the rent arrears and the impact of the removal of the £20 uplift on that. Um, and it's um, 
our housing management officers are in daily contact with income maximisation um, and making making referrals. We've got our um, our own services intensive support officers that that we fund to also help um, with assisting um, assisting tenants who are having trouble paying their rent. Um, our first um, our first approach is always to support our tenants and to get to the bottom of what um, what issues they're experiencing with paying their rent and seeing what we can do to resolve those issues as much as possible and working with our partners to do that. Um, contract availability. Um, my colleague Colin Sharp is the the repairs manager, and um, he he's he agrees that that's a um, that is an issue for our service. Um, and it's not just with repairs. You'll probably hear that with the um, capital report, which I know Izzy McIver is going to present later in in the committee. Um, and it's not um, it's not just us. That are ex that's experiencing that issue. There is a general um, issue with um, contractor availability across um, across all services, I think. Um, but we're doing our best to manage it. We've got our own in-house trades um, who do quite a bit of the work for us. Um, it's just when that when these jobs get a little bit more complex, or we need some specialist contractors, or um, the or, or there's a particular range of work that we're trying to manage through some um, economies of scale. There's, that is generally where we encounter that. Um, it's ongoing impact of COVID um, as well as um, the general um, economic matters that are probably in, impacting that around um, supplies and availability of skills. Thanks. Uh... Thanks, Rory. I'm just looking at the number of homeless presentations. Admittedly, this is for the whole of Ross and Cromarty, um, which has gone up quite a lot after a period of being relatively stable uh, in quarter two. Do you think this is seasonal or is it something more significant? Uh, it's probably more to do with the changes in re uh, COVID restrictions. Um, more, uh. movement, more movement of people um, means we're probably starting to see a more um, yeah, I, I, the it, it's hard to get to to say exactly what the one issue is, but if there was one thing that coincided with with that um, lift in presentations, it would be the changes in COVID restrictions and greater movement uh, mm. of people uh, in and around Highlands. Um, but um, it's still of a level with what we'd normally expect in a quarter um, in Ross and Cromarty. OK, fine. Um, I don't know if you're the right person to ask, but is there a particular problem with the waiting lists in, in the Black Isle? Um, in, in in what respect? Uh, you mean um, people waiting longer for yeah, housing? Yeah. yeah, that's right, exactly. Um, it, it, the, it, so that's a fairly, um, there's probably a fairly complex answer to that. It, it very much depends on what style of housing someone is um, seeking and, or needs and the location that they need that housing. Um, so there's, yeah, it, I'll, um, I'll, I'll take an example of if you're talking about large family homes, um, you know, if someone is looking for a large family home, um, we have a limited supply of large family homes, and although the, the wait list might be smaller for people waiting for large family homes, the, low, the turnover is, is lower. Um, so if we've got um, people in those circumstances and they're waiting for a large family home in, say, um, those example, then we need, to, um, we need to look at what someone's options are, be that in... Um, social rented housing through um, council or one of our partners or um, the private sector or um, or what the um, development program program could possibly deliver uh, depending on the availability of, of land. Um, and that issue is replicated in differing ha different housing types across uh, across the Highland Housing Register and um, so it, if you wanted specific detail about the, the, the Black Isle waiting lists, I could um, 
go away and come back with that information, but it probably would um, be best coming to board business. So I can talk through that in a bit more detail. Yeah, no, no that's fine. I, I just wanted to know if there was a particular issue there that concerned the blackout that you were worried about, but it sounds like it, there isn't a particular issue. I, yeah, I wouldn't say there's a particular issue that's not a broader issue across, that, across yeah. the area. Okay. Okay, fine. Thanks very much. Craig, have you another point? Sorry, it's just a quick question. Page 15, um, reactive repairs carried out first time. What, what do we actually mean by reactive? I understand proactive. Uh, reactive, I think it's the opposite, but if because um, it looks like a bit of a slippage there, and it's the only one that, of that list that's in the red, so I'd assume that you would be focusing on that to get that into the amber and the green. Yes, that's that's correct. A reactive repair is a um, responsive or a repair that's reported to us. Um, so these the, the data is picked up out of our um, our housing information system. Um, so if someone um, calls the call centre and asks for a repair to be done, then an appointment will be made and um, and a, a a contractor or a one of our trades will attend and carry out that repair. Um, and that figure is based on whether we've made the, um, kept our appointment time um, or whether we've had to come back and do um, carry out um, extra repairs. And that may be the case sometimes with, with an emergency is we'll go out and deal with the emergency issue, but there might be more parts required to um, come back and pick up the rest of the job on a on a separate ticket. Um, that figure itself, um, I haven't. It's not um, disaggregated down to Black Isle, so um, that is across Ross and Cromarty. But I can. Um, we're working on disaggregating that that ta that appendix table uh, across the Ross and Cromarty wards, as, um, but that might not happen until next year. OK, thank yeah. you very much I'll, indeed. I'll, I'll just come back on that if I may. I'll, I'll, I'll pick up on that point with, with Colin because uh, I've got a very good, strong working relationship with, Cromit, with Colin regarding uh, building maintenance and, and repairs and that. So I'll pick that one up uh, with Colin at the other agenda item. Thank you, Rory. Rory, uh, that's great. I don't think there are any further questions. Um, so thank you very much indeed for your report. and. Um, and, uh, and and um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member. Okay. Okay. The next uh, agenda item is the area. Uh, da, 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 the Ross and Cromarty Educational Trust. Now, I think Derek Martin is going to give us a a, a quick introduction to this one. Um, Derek. Uh, good morning, Chair, and good morning, Members. I'm actually on holiday today, so forgive me. I'm on a mobile phone at the moment. Uh, and I don't have the paper actually uh, in front of me. But uh, in summary, the uh, Ross and Cromarty Trust was badly affected, of course, with COVID last year, which meant that grant aid wasn't processed in, uh, in start, uh, f uh, at the end of the financial year due to the lockdown. And so we processed them in uh, May and June, which of course goes into the next uh, financial year. Unfortunately, it meant that the revenue that was available for it had to be returned legally to the capital. We did explore, as you'll see in the paper, if there was any option for us to carry that revenue forward. But unfortunately, we weren't able to. So following discussion with the executive chief officer and the chair of the education committee and two senior members uh, that cover uh, uh, mid-area, um, it was decided that we would put an emergency payment of just over £21,000 from the area education budget uh, into the Ross and Cromarty Trust in order that we would be able to make some payments uh, in May and June uh, of last year, um, primarily due to the applications which reflected the COVID situation, whereby people who were applying uh, to it their parents uh, had been badly affected, some businesses had closed and so on. And so it was good that we were able to do that one-off payment. 
uh, from the area into the trust on the trustee's behalf to make those payments. Going forward, uh, you can see that uh, we're uncertain what the financial situation is going to be like for the next few years. And that might well have an impact on the trust's capability to make further payments uh, of uh, any size going forward for a few years. We just don't know yet. But for the moment, uh, we managed to make uh, the trust payments uh, for the last, uh, the last uh, session, which was uh, useful. Um, you can see the report there, members, for noting. Uh, I am happy to take any questions around it, and forgive me again that uh, I'm not on video. Unfortunately, the phone won't take it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Derek. Um, who is it who looks after the investment side of this trust, Derek? So that's looked after by the finance uh, section of Highland Council. And you'll recall under the old Ross and Cromarty committee, we modernised the trust about uh, oh, three years ago, I think, where we uh, made it uh, more appropriate because it still referred to pounds and shillings and so on. Uh, so that was modernised, uh, as I say, about three years ago, and there was no need at that point to look at the investments because they were making a reasonable uh, return. But the finance section do that on members' behalf, and uh, it was suggested in the Dingwall and Seaforth uh, meeting last week that it might be useful to look at the investments going forward again, and we can take advice from the finance department around that. Yes, because it, it does seem to be very restrictive. Um, I mean, the capital fund sits at 1.6 million, um, and we don't appear to be able to take out more than a few thousand each year. Um, yeah, the average, I would, uh, the average appears to be around. Sorry, the average appears to be around 15,000. Although the previous year, I think it was about 12. Uh, maybe no surprise with the, with the COVID uh, situation. Um, yeah. But yes, it's, it does strike me that uh, that for the amount of capital, it's not necessarily a huge a huge return of available funds. Now, the Don Craig Trust, which is also mentioned in the report, uh, has a, a similar uh, amount of revenue uh, each year. Uh, so, I'm not being a financial expert, I'm not certain what we can do investment-wise, but uh, maybe the, the finance side of things would be able to help. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm, I think it may be worth looking at uh, whether or not the investments are, you know, whether the, the return could improve um, were they perhaps being handled by um, by a different investment broker. Uh, I'm no expert on this, but I, I think it's worth looking at because I think it would be benefit beneficial to 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 our constituents if we could make say £25,000 available each year rather than just 15000 and I wouldn't have thought with a, a, a capital fund of 1.6 million that that's unrealistic. I would have thought it's perfectly realistic. Um, so I wonder if you could perhaps sort of look into that in, 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 in the next uh, month or two, uh, Derek, to see whether or not something like that could be, could be arranged. Um, um, Craig. Craig, Craig, we can't really hear sorry, you. Yeah, uh, sorry, yeah. I've, I've, I've done that. Yeah. Right. Um, you've picked up on the point that um, triggered with myself is that with any investment fund, we have to balance the liabilities to the incomes and the um, sorry, the liabilities and income to the fund, whether it comes from uh, investment performance or contributions from elsewhere. Now, with that size of fund, I would think it reasonable that we should, with uh, financial diligence and fiduciary um, constraint, be able to increase that fifteen hundred, that fifteen thousand to somewhere like twenty or twenty-five. I, I have to completely agree, but we would need to have the finance ed foster's finance department actually look at that to see what we can actually do uh, because we do have a fiduciary duty and that fund obviously needs to run for as long as we've got pupils or people that need access to it or pupil uh, youths that need access to it but i think that we should that's only one percent 
and most pension funds at the moment are running at five. Yeah. So we should be able to increase it, say, to 2%. What would that actually look like without compromising the actual fund itself? And I think if we can sit down with Derek um, and say Ed Foster or, or the fund managers of, of this and say, look, you know, we're taking out one, one and a half percent. Is there a possibility for us to take out 2%? And what would that give us as an additional that we can use for educational purposes on the Black Isle? I think that's a good suggestion, Craig. Um, perhaps that's something that we can fix up in um, the, the, the next um, few weeks, uh, Derek. Um, can, I, can we leave that in your hands? Uh, yes, I think uh, that's the general feeling from a number of uh, committees to see what could be done. And uh, I'll be speaking to the finance side of things to see what the options are. One of the other things, members, that uh, uh, another uh, committee were conscious of was about the, um, the type of investments. Um, you know, certain uh, uh, investments, of course, uh, often make a better return, but uh, may raise uh, moral questions such as investment in arms and so on. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that's something else uh, to consider uh, as well. well. So yes, I think it would be a good idea because uh, increasingly uh, we're getting, uh, since the modernisation of the Ross and Cromarty Trust in particular, we're now getting uh, a good number of applications uh, after years of uh, not much happening. Uh, so it would be good to maximise uh, what we can revenue-wise. Good. Thank you, Derek, very much. It sounds like you're either building or demolishing a house. I'm not sure of which. I've <laughs> <laughs> the walking-in shed uh, this morning. Uh, we are busy uh, working away on various projects at uh, nearby the school. So lovely to see. <laughs> OK, very good. Thank you very much for your report. I appreciate uh, taking time off your, 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 your holiday. Thanks. Um, right. Um, so, um, Members, we, we note this report um, and uh, also note the request that we have a look again at the investment strategy. Um, fine, uh, and now we come to the Inner Murray Firth uh, proposed local development plan and, and Tim starts. Tim has already made one uh, presentation on this this morning um, and I think you're going to rattle through it again for our benefit. Right, Tim, over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning, members. Uh, if you bear with me, I'll just get my pointer set up so we can go, go through this. Right. Yes, the, the, this item seeks your approval of the local detail of the new Inner Firth Local Development Plan as it affects your ward. I'll take you through that local detail soon, but uh, first of all, some wider context as to where we are in the plan process itself. Uh, you may recall we were with you, oh, sorry, we weren't with uh, the Black Owl Committee because that wasn't formed at the time, but uh, we were around the uh, uh, local city committees about a year ago, uh, seeking your approval of what was called a main issue support, which was a, a options draft of the, of the plan. Uh, we consulted on that, on that uh, document at the beginning of 2021. Uh, we've got an awful lot of comments which we've been through and that has shaped uh, the office recommendations that are before you uh, now. The, this Black Isle Committee is one of six local city committees um, that are being asked to approve the or to choose and approve the, uh, the local detail. Uh, there are plan-wide issues which are in Appendix 2 of your papers, which um, really rest with the Economy and Infrastructure Committee on the 2nd of December to decide upon, but we are seeking uh, local city committee views on the detail of Appendix 2 as well. So we, we are asking you to consider the comments that have been received on the main issue support and to agree to the, um, the main content of the proposed plan. That will then be issued at the beginning of next year, probably in March time. Uh, and then thereafter, um, uh, there will be a, a period of eight weeks for comments and objections, and those ob objections will be referred to a government appointed reporter, probably around about the end of next next year for that. That's the plan area, uh, the wider boundary of it, so it covers quite a large area, and obviously the Black Isle is central to it. 
Uh, I'm going to go take you through that local detail very soon, but uh, just so you're aware, the highlighted uh, yellow boxes here highlight the main settlements that cover your uh, are fall within your boundary. Um, I've included North Cassock and Tor, which uh, overlap with your boundary. So yes, we, we uh, part of the papers are the um, telling you what people have said on the main issues report. We've had over 1,400 comments, which is a record number for any uh, local development plan in Highland. Uh, the methods that we use to get that uh, amount of comments is that we did a postcard, postcard mail shot of every single household. We had a social media campaign, lots of online videos on what the plan was about and how to make comments. We attended a lot of, certainly on the Black Hour, attended an awful lot of Teams and Zooms, uh, Zoom meetings, which were organized by local groups. Uh, where community councils weren't commenting, we phoned them up to um, seek their views and we had paper copy options available as well. So because of that met those methods have worked fairly well, we propose and section seven of the covering report, you'll see the uh, proposed method and timing of the consultation. Uh, eight weeks consultation beginning in March and we will consider face-to-face uh, -face meetings if we're allowed to under government guidance at that time. I mentioned Appendix 2, this is the plan-wide detail, uh, sorry, so the plan-wide content there, so a lot of what we call general policies are contained in here, so for example there's a, a new um, policy on um, forcing landowners and developers to provide uh, a proportion of self-build plots within the bigger bigger sites. Um, they, another example is we're increasing the affordable housing percentage to 35% within the city boundary. So, you know, that, that sort of um, detail and new ways of doing things are um, within Appendix 2 and we would, uh, every local city committee is being asked for their views on those issues as well. Um, housing and the countryside hinterland boundary, uh, some of the other Local city committees wanted to see a change in it. And, and, uh, when we came to you the last time, there, there wasn't any desire on the blackout to change it. Uh, the reordered settlement hierarchy doesn't affect any main settlement on the blackout. There aren't any changes proposed there. Um, housing land requirements. There's a table within Appendix 2 which sets the mid Ross housing market area housing target, and that's in line with the um, uh, national planning framework that was issued last week by the Oh, sorry, announced in Parliament uh, last week, and the, there's a, a Highland uh, target of 9,500 over the next 10 years, and you'll see that the Mid Ross uh, housing market area fits with that. Uh, so yeah, what the each local city committee is being asked to decide upon the local detail. Uh, and by local detail, I mean which sites to earmark for development within each main settlement. Uh, the list of land uses which would be acceptable on those sites. Uh, there's also a new maps which you haven't seen before, members, which is for each main settlement, uh, a map showing which areas of green space should be protected from d d development. Again, the idea is to flag up for local communities and developers, which where we will not encourage any planning applications at all. Uh, there's an indicative housing capacity given for the main sites, and there's a list, list of placemaking priorities uh, for each place as well. These are important because uh, obviously if we get a planning application out with any of the allocated sites, then we have, have to have a set of uh, guidance that applies to any other planning applications within the village boundaries, so that's what they are. So I'll quickly run you through the seven main settlements on the Black Isle. Um, Within Och, uh, so the, the colours here, uh, is, this is just a base map from the main issues report, but the important things to bear in mind, members, are the whether it's, there's a red X or a uh, a white tick in a green circle. Uh, the these are the officer recommendation whether to keep the site in from the main issues report or not. So uh, the AVO8, uh, we're, we're not proposing that's included, hence the red X. Uh, Rose Hawk East Drive North, not to be included. Uh, the wider expansion at uh, Muir Rail House, we don't think that that's a good idea. Uh, Cemetery Hill, uh, AB06, that's not to be recommended for in in inclusion. And uh, the in 
industrial estate expansion at the south end of Arch, we had in the main issue support shown it as green, i.e. a preferred site. Um, but the, there was uh, quite a few comments received on the main issue support whether locals were concerned about that site, didn't want to, to see it taken forward and highlighted very uh, good issues in terms of the whether there was sufficient road capacity to cope with additional vehicle trips from from that size of site. So the officer recommendation before you is to agree with those uh, comments and not uh, take AV05 forward. Uh, however, we are um, taking the harbour um, proposal forward. That's just a revamp to dredge the harbour and maybe to um, uh, tidy up the backup land adjacent to the Harbour. So that's uh, AVO4. Roshoch East uh, Drive South is had a uh, has had a previous planning permission and there's still a planning planning application pending on on that site. So we think that should be taken forward. Um, Memorial Field AVO2 is on site now, almost complete. Uh, any site that's fully complete will will won't appear on the proposed plan mapping. Uh, the, so really, the only site apart from AVO1 that we have. Uh, for future development is uh, AVO3. Uh, um, so this is a mural rail house, uh, a mixture of housing uh, community and other uses are proposed on that site. Cromarty, um, again, a slight difference from what was in the main issues report. You see that it was shown as red, i.e. a non-preferred site in the main issues report, uh, but you'll see that there's a big uh, tick now. And the reason for that is we, well, because of doubts about the only uh, housing and other development site that we have in the town, uh, known I think by the locals as Jocks Field. Uh, we um, there's issues with the site in term. Alban Housing Society own it, uh, and we had a meeting with them to to see whether they were um, uh, keen to take it forward and able to take it forward. And um, because of the access uh, concerns along the south side of the um, Victoria Hall playing field, um, it, it, it's, it's not uh, well, it doesn't appear at present to be what we call an effective and a viable site because of the, the, the need for um, a, a costly and an, a difficult access improvement to it. So because of the doubts about Jocksfield site, we are recommending to you today to take forward the what we call the south south of the man site. Uh, for uh, a, a, a mixture of, of housing uh, community and maybe a uh, business use as well. Uh, Mr. McBean uh, is the landowner and via his agent, he's confirmed he's prepared to look at um, affordable housing development, self-build self plots, and uh, um, certainly via his agent has confirmed that he's prepared to look at a, a rural housing burden, which would uh, con control the, uh, who the houses were uh, made available to and to control control the um, future sale of those houses on the open market. Finally, CMO2 uh, is the campervan uh, planning permission site, or, uh, including adjoining land as well, just in case the, the, um, the campervan service area doesn't prove to be large enough, and to also allow some additional planting on the uh, western approach to, to the town. Koboki, uh, when Koboki were really going with the same recommendations as the way you endorsed in the main issues report, CU1, uh, this is the Toluca development, CU01, which is on site now, uh, almost finished. Uh, CU02 is the, the community proposal for mainly community and green space uses. I think that's on site or be on site soon as well. Uh, Mr. Dingwall's site in the middle of the um, the village. Uh, uh, there, this isn't likely to be available for for development, so that's why that's proposed to be taken out. CU04 at the northern end of the village. Uh, the landowner's agent has complained that it um, may come out of the plan, but we don't feel there's uh, sufficient need and demand in the village to include these sites. And um, there's been no written proof that the ransom issue of this road access has been resolved at either. Um, so therefore, given these the sites almost finished, uh, we need other housing land in, in the village. Um, Fowler's Croft has got a planning permission and is part built. And there's a small further site to the south of it where there's this green green tickers, which is a pre-application at the moment. We think that that would be a suitable infill site as well. So we're recommending that is taken forward. 
for Trojan Prismarki is really just rolling forward sites in the existing 2015 adopted plan and were uh, with the same recommendations as the main issues report. Greenside Farm has got applying permission and is part built. Uh, the uh, final bit of the housing component of the Nest Gap site, uh, FRO2, the Fraser family uh, are seeking to take it forward, but don't have any uh, viable and suitable road access to it, apart from coming off I think it's, it's Dolphin Drive or something. It's called the uh, Tullock Controlled Access Point. So there's a there's a debate about the price of um, whether a ransom applies to access FR2, but we think it's a suitable infill site so it's got a, a, a green tick attached to it. Cemetery extension FR03, uh, there's nothing in the council's program and there there isn't a, a very, um, a, a, there, there should be enough layers to cope with the, the current need and uh, demand for layers within that site at the moment so we're not recommendation, uh, recommending that that's taken forward. Malachi Broadlands, you may remember, came in with two large expansion sites for the village, shown, shown in red, uh, both uh, west and east of the village. We're not proposing, um, the officer recommendation is not to include those. It is, though, to include the ones that have got uh, recent planning permission, ML02, south of the post office, uh, Hill, Hill Park Bray, um, went to the North Planning Applications Committee and has got a recent planning permission. ML03 was in the past reserved for a new primary school. Uh, again, there's no capital program allocation and perhaps this isn't the best the best place for it on the black hour, but we think that that should be reserved for other community uses. And finally, ML04, Fraser's Garage, uh, uh, trying to roll forward the allocation of land there too and to allow a wee bit of expansion uh, should uh, Fraser's wish to uh, improve or enhance their operation at that site. North Keswick, uh, Broadlands again through the initial phase of the plan process tried to persuade us to allocate a huge area for development west of North Keswick. You'll see from the red X's we're, we're not uh, um, endorsing that as officers uh, apart from NK01. So this is where the um, uh, the hotel, uh, there was an old golf course uh, planning proposal, and this is where the, the commercial element was to have been placed. Uh, we are recommend base, recommending as officers that this is included in the new plan for around about 80 houses. Uh, and, but you can just about on the aerial uh, photo base, you can see there's a planting belt that was uh, part of the last phase. We are, are not proposing any development on that portion of that site. So uh, not all of the, the area shown in green would be de 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 developed. Uh, but that's um, say that we are proposing that one. Um, there's the park and ride or park and choose site uh, NK02 by the A9 junction. We think that that's the optimum place for a park and ride site to intercept uh, uh, commuters going in, into Inverness. Um, I mean, obviously a lot of people working from home at the moment, but that may change in the future and the, the queues to get in, into into Inverness in the morning may grow longer again. So we think there's a this is the optimum location to intercept those uh, those uh, c c commuter trips um, uh, rather than tour as currently envisaged within the 2015 adopted plan. Uh, NK03, you'll be aware, members, most of you, I think that that was a had various uh, camper van caravan um, uh, servicing site proposals for it. Uh, there has been local concern about the impact it will have on the neighbours and the uh, the footpath connection into the village centre, uh, but we we still think that the principle of a, uh, a perhaps a, a camper van service site only, uh, not of the same size perhaps, uh, um, should be endorsed within the newer plan. Transport Scotland have also expressed a concern about uh, the increase in vehicle trips using the junctions, and that's, I think, a very good reason to um, um, to control the, the size of any proposal on NK03. Almost finished, members. Uh, Tor, I think, is the final main settlement. And uh, you may be aware there's a pre-application proposal from a major house builder to um, to try and get uh, a proposal through on uh, the TR, TR04 sites, these three sites with a big red X. Uh, and you can see 
obviously from the Red X is that the officer recommendation is not to include them. Neither is it for the officers to to, to include uh, TR03 north of the of Tor, which was the original Broadlands proposal. Broadlands have since confirmed they are the uh, principal landowner of uh, this TRO3 site. They've confirmed in writing that they don't intend to take it forward themselves. So, uh, so basically, all all of the large red sites are not recommended for inclusion in the new plan. TRO1 has had a very recent planning permission for 14 units, uh, so that's been issued. TRO2 is to allow the expansion of existing industrial uses. These are industrial units in here, and you've got the grain silos to the south of. TRO2 site. So we feel that there's a um, um, tour is a good place for further employment uh, uses, uh, albeit that there are road access capacity concerns. And but and there is a woodland issue with the site as well. But with that, that woodland would perhaps help hide industrial sheds as well if we were if if um, a proposal were to come forward on that land. That chair, I think, is it. Uh, happy to answer any points. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, Tim, my problem with my microphone. Thank you very much indeed <clears throat> for going through that again. Um, Craig. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Before I start, I'd just like to say what an amount, huge amount of work that you and your team uh, have put into this to get to a proposal that community councils on the Black Isle at this stage can interact with. That we have a wealth of people uh, within our community community councils and community that are really engaged and fully understand the planning process. And to have this opportunity to discuss this before we get out to the public is really to be welcome because we can then develop a planning strategy for this for the Black Isle as we're talking about here to um, uh, get a, a framework that, that is broadly um, accepted by the majority of people. What I would like to highlight and it's something that we myself and I think Gordon did at the very start of this process uh, in particular for myself and that's the environment. Are you able to pull up the inner Murray Firth strategy map that you pulled up first on, on screen and that should able be able to illustrate the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, I think it's the, the third one, third one along. That one, yes, right. Now in, in the report, um, You've got policy two and policy three, which is nature protection, preservation enhancement for part number two, and then go on to green space. Now, I've had a particular um, knowledge and concern about our marine environment. Now, the bullet points, um, I mean, the first, the, I will say the first paragraph on policy two sums it up in a nutshell, but the bullet points underneath are all land-based bullet points. The, I've looked through this um, draft again and the, there's nothing to do with the blue space. Now if you look at the Black Isle, 80% of, of the Black Isle is bounded by water. We have a, Our communities have a sea border and then when you move into Nairn and across that side they have a sea border. Um, so I think we should actually have an additional space there, an additional policy, if you like. Policy 2A would be called blue space, and that would pick up the OSPA areas, Ramsar, Triple SI sites, uh, the SAC. There's a proposed marine uh, protected area, and also <coughs> to include the agriculture supplementary planning guidance, because we have uh, businesses especially in Cromarty, that are now looking at using the marine environment for sustainable development and jobs. And that would work very, very well with what's been discussed at, at COP22. And other commentators have men mentioned about the carbon capture of our sea, our seabed and our, our sea environment. And I would actually like to see something firmed up 
and actually uh, a proper comment in there, bringing in the relevant officers to have the marine environment included in this Inner Murray Firth local development plan. I don't think that would be without the brief uh, that you have here, because the brief is, uh, as I'm reading it, is 99% land based and rightly so, but we need to take cognizance of the marine environment, especially for those communities that have a marine border, a sea border with our development area. And I'd like to have your thoughts on that and what would be the, the right way to or the appropriate time to to get that worked up to come into a discussion process within the Inner Murray Firth local development plan? Thanks, Craig. I mean, <clears throat> this is particularly apt because of everything that's happening or potentially happening within the Cromarty Firth, where there could well be a, a clash between industrial and and, and, and other development. Uh, yeah, Tim, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? OK, uh, it isn't easy, I'm afraid. Uh, the local development plans are allowed to control development down to low watermark, but that's it. So the um, I don't think the government would allow us to take forward a, a local development plan which had policies and proposals for anything below low watermark. I mean, there is a, a, a national m m marine plan and I think there are meant to be regional marine plans as well. So, and the Highland Council would uh, take a part, so I would maybe help prepare that as well. So there is, I think there is a, a going to be a legal document that in, in terms of the regional marine plan where um, the Highland Council could certainly have an input to what policies apply to offshore developments uh, below low watermark but the certainly the the current um range if you like that can uh, of, of policies and control that can apply within a local development plan ends at low uh, watermark what we can do and what um uh, nature's nature scott have asked us to do is assess any onshore development that will impact on you know, on the, the 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 sort of marine zone. So, we have to assess um, any any onshore development for what uh, impacts it may have offshore. So, so that there are the any coastal allocations, and we have a few within the wider plan uh, where there may be a, an offshore impact. Then, yeah, we can certainly um, get the developer to assess if if there will be any offshore impact from an onshore d development pro proposal. So any any well, sorry, all the allocations in this new plan which are near the coast, we 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 will be um, uh, we will be asking the developer to any assess any offshore impact. But as I say, we 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 uh, can't. Um, allocate anything offshore or if you like or we can't uh, have a, a a sort of a policy if you like which which seeks to control what happens offshore it's it, as i say that there's a separate legal uh, uh plan that, that would uh, to do that i say that there's a national marine plan been prepared but obviously because it, it doesn't go into any detail for our our coastlines and um, so it's so yeah that there, there are the there is a gap there, uh, but as I say, the, the regional marine plan would be uh, the document to fill that void. OK. Yeah, Could I great. just quickly come back? Thank you very much for the that explanation, uh, Tim. What, what I'll do is I'll scan my notes from page 54 and I'll, I'll circulate that to your team and to our climate change officers. Um, and then that would allow them to follow my train of thinking. Sometimes my train of thinking can be a bit, little bit left field at times. Um, but once I've asked the question, then people can then, like you, like you have said there, say, right, we're our responsibility is only down to the low water mark. Yet we have developments, or we could, we would have aquaculture developments that will be below the the. Uh, low water mark so that was a very useful comment there tim thank you very much for that yeah and, and craig if you want to pursue that you you need to get in touch with 
the officers that deal with the regional marine plan, and I imagine that's Malcolm McLeod, I should think, but I'm not entirely certain. Uh, uh, can you, can, 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 do, you, do you know about that, Tim? Who would be the best person in the council? I say I, I, I don't think that I think there's a debate at the moment as to who prepares them. Right. Uh, um, um, I think yes. I, I think I. I don't think government have uh, in Edinburgh have made a final decision on who uh, leads on them, which is, which is why they haven't been d d done yet. I think uh, agencies are trying to pass the buck to each other. I think. You know, if I was blunt. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we'll watch the space. We'll leave it at that. I think. Um, Councillor Barclay is listening. Um, she she's able to 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 follow what is going on. Um, I don't think she wishes to speak, but if she does, she may have to do so via die because there's a slightly complicated communications arrangement there. But she, oh, she's here. Oh, hello, Jennifer. How nice to hear you. Do you do you have anything you would like to ask? Phones at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you it's, want? It's very difficult. Yes, but. Uh... Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, do you have any questions you want to ask Tim? Uh, no, well, I was just wondering about the one down at Northern Drive. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, right, uh, is that in, in, in Fortrose? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, right, uh, Tim, do you want to pick that up? Right. Yes, yeah, certainly, yeah, the... Uh, the problem there that the Fraser family uh, obviously want to make it available for house house build house building uh, we've put in an indicative uh, capacity of 12 units which is what the family want to um, build out on that site but they unfortunately Tullox, um own the what's called the ransom or the the, the verge at the side of Dolphin Drive so it's it's there isn't really an awful lot that the council can do to um, assist the Fraser family in uh, removing that ransom that the house, the house builder yeah. has. Okay. Yes, yes, it's all right. Yes, I know exactly where it is. Yes, it seems quite a narrow ransom strip, but but that'll be up to the planning to, to see. Well, that. it's. I mean, it's really, again, if I can be blunt, it's up to the, the Fraser family to talk to the owner to see whether they can agree a price. So and I think that the Fraser family do have another access option off uh, to the, the south, the south of the site. But it, 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 it's, it's the, the housing capacity would have to come come down because it, it, it isn't possible to to form a, a full width of access road. So, yeah, the, the, they the family do have another road route into the site but it it wouldn't um and the the western green gates path would be affected as well so it isn't ideal to come in from that side okay the, the other side would be perfect but not from the bottom mm, yes okay thank you jennifer thank you thank you tim um, and let me just um, endorse what what Craig said earlier, Tim. Uh, we really are, are grateful to you and the amount of time uh, you've taken in uh, consulting local communities. As you said, uh, 1,400 um, uh, comments, uh, a record apparently. That's uh, quite something. It shows the intense level of local interest there is in this whole process. And it is, I think, uh, a tribute to the fact that you have consulted so effectively that uh, this morning when we had our pre-meeting with the community councils and, and other community groups, um, that there was a broad support for the plans that you put ahead. Um, so I, um, our job now is, is, to, is, is to note the report, um, and I better read this out because there's quite a lot that we have to note. Uh, so so just, just bear with me, please. We've got to know the issues raised by respondents, the consultation on the um, on, on the local committee specific matters, agree the recommended recommended responses to these issues as detailed in Appendix One. Note the issues raised by respondents to the consultation on strategic matters and officer recommended responses, both as detailed in Appendix Two, and to recommend to the Economy and Infrastructure Committee the uh, the local committee's view on these strategic matters. 
Note the additional supporting documents will accompany the publication of the proposed plan, including those outlined in section three. Note the minor presentational, typographical and other updates um, that will be made by officers and agree to any material changes um, made in the future. Um, and in line with government guidance, to agree for the published in my first local proposed local development plan to be treated as a material planning consideration in making planning decisions and providing advice and agree the approach to consultation outlined in section seven of this report. Um, uh, members, are, are we are we happy to note all of that and to agree with the recommendations? Well, I, I can see Craig nodding and I'm happy and I, I you yeah. are too. That's it's fine. OK. Thank you. OK. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks to you, Tim. Thank you. Bye. Good luck with the rest of the work involved in this. Thanks. Bye. OK. Bye bye. Um, right. I think we go on to coastal communities. I'm spooling through this immense report to try and find the right place. Um, and I believe that um, yeah, basically it's the assessment of applications. Um, and I think, is Fiona with us or is it Sarah who is with us? Sarah, hello, Sarah. Hi, thanks, Chair, and morning, members. Um, so we just have the one application going forward for consideration today, and that is from Ferentosh Community Hall um, for support towards improving the energy efficiency of the hall. Um, works include building work to form a false ceiling for the installation of roof insulation, electrical works and finishing decoration along with architectural uh, fees. Um, the applicant has stated that the poor heating efficiency is currently limiting the use of the building. Um, so to go through the technical assessment um, provided with the application, um, it generally scored well throughout the technical assessment. Um, however, there are a couple of sections where the project scored lower. Uh, the first being project robustness. Um, so for the project costs, um, three quotations have been provided, um, but the quotes date back to November 2020, meaning that the project costs given in the application are out of date. Um, the applicant has estimated that the given cost may have risen by approximately 10,000 since the, the quotes um, were given on the basis that material costs um, are currently around about 150% higher um, than this time last year. Um, the applicant has 11,000 match funding in place. However, the current shortfall with the current shortfall and the increase in materials, the applicant may have to source around uh, 14,000 additional match funding. Um, the applicant is looking for match funders and is currently in the process of submitting applications to the Landfill Tax Fund and SSE. Um, under engagement and support, it's been uh, given a lower score there just on the basis that um, they haven't provided any evidence of commu community engagement and usually what we'd like to see there are letters of support. And just to highlight as well that the applicant doesn't currently have an equal opportunities policy in place. So that's been added as a condition of grant. And it's also been stipulated as a pre-start condition that match funding is to be confirmed before the, the works begin. Um, and members should also note that the request of £10,380 exceeds that available as there's only £6,557 91 pence remaining in the Black Isle budget. Thank you, Sarah. Um, right. Um, OK, look, I, I just need a little, a little um, um, clarification on that last point. Um, we have only 6,000 left in our budget and they require 10,000 roughly. Uh, well, they, they require rather more than that because of the increased costs. Um, OK, uh, that, that's something I, I wasn't aware of. So what is your, what is, in a nutshell, what is your recommendation here? 
Um, well, as I mentioned, the project has scored fairly well on the, the technical assessment. It's just the issue that they're going to have to source this additional match funding. Um, so they have intended to start the project in February, um, but obviously the timing of the delivery of the project will be entirely tied to when they can get their match funding um, in place, basically. Okay. Um, but the applicant is aware of the amount remaining in the Black Isle budget, so they are aware that their request exceeded and um, that was available. Okay, Riz, I'm, I'm just checking the figures now. All right, fine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well, we've discussed this in ward business meetings, and I think we're all very happy that this should go ahead. Um, do, does anyone have any um, any comments? Craig, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I welcome the, and, and support the um, the project. I mean, I've used, I've been in that hall frequently, and uh, I welcome the the uh, the application. One thing I think that many people are now finding that quotes from um, companies that can actually do the work from you know your normal material, your normal trades. You, they're finding it extremely difficult to actually provide quotes that they can categorically guarantee for any length of time. So it's more estimates that we're playing with, and I think that needs to that comment needs to go out to to communities. I think they're probably aware of that already. Even if you want some uh, roofing done or some bricklaying done, the material costs. Are changing so dramatically that it's making it life really difficult for contractors to actually give a definitive quote at what they're actually going to come in at. Um, so I think that estimates is probably a better way that we we need to to look at these projects rather than quotes because quotes can change. Where if it's an estimate, there's a bit more leeway for uh, a contractor to say to a community, this is what I anticipate it's going to be. However, I, my my time is what it is, but the material costs are fluctuating so frequently upwards rather than downwards. Uh, would they need to have that uh, within the, uh, the the discussions at the time? I hope I've I hope I've said that in the manner I needed to say it. <laughs> So you're suggesting that perhaps this, these these um, projects should be assessed on the basis of estimates rather than actual quotes. Is that right? Yeah, I think Great. estimates would be probably um, a fair way of doing it because then. Yeah, no, I understand your point. Yeah, I think okay. that would. I might not have articulated it. No, no, um, I, understand. I think I, I just yeah. I, I grasped it. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, what, what is your view on that, uh, uh, Sarah? The, the question: Do you actually require precise quotes, and you hold you hold them to to the you you hold the applicants to these quotes, or under these uh, under this particular situation we're in now, uh, are you content with estimates? Um, I totally agree with uh, Councillor Fraser's comments. There, it has been extremely difficult yeah. for ap applicants to gauge project costs, um, given the the situation between just availability of contractors and the rising price of materials. Um, but at application stage, we don't actually enforce that the costs are based on quotes. We can accept estimates at application stage. We've really left it up to applicants, which they would prefer. Um, where we do request quotes is where a project has been approved and before they can start, then we ask for the quotes to be provided. Um, so we don't actually uh, enforce quotes at application stage, and applicants can use estimates. Okay, that's very that's very good to know. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, if there are no further questions, can we agree to this project going ahead? Okay. Gen yes. Jennifer, you okay? Okay, fine. Right. Yeah, fine by me. Right, we'll, we'll go ahead on that. Thanks very much indeed, Sarah. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Bye -bye. Right. Um, OK, next agenda item is place based investment funds, propo proposed funding allocations. Um, Di, from, from memory, I, I think that I'm just going to run through this myself or is someone going to do a yes. quick introduction? 
I'm just going to do it myself. It's okay for you because we would just be repeating each other, I think. Yes, indeed. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Well, as um, um, as you know, uh, we have got um, a fund of £100,000 place-based investment fund, um, uh, similar to all other awards in the Highland Council. Um, and this fund is intended to enable a flexible local response to address the four harms of COVID, um, which are direct health harms, health impacts not directly related to COVID, societal impacts and economic impacts. Now, how we uh, we discussed this in a world business meeting and um, the uh, decisions we came up with was that uh, the 20,000, uh, we divided with £20,000 for mental health and well-being, £25,000 for community spaces, uh, £25,000 to establish a grant fund for investment in community-led projects to address the four harms, and £30,000 to support sustainable economic recovery. Um, and the way that we, um, we, we decided to allocate the money was for £20,000 for mental health and well-being, with a particular focus on younger people, older people and disabled people to reduce um, increased feelings of anxiety and so so social isolation. And this funding it will be delegated to the Fortress Academy Black Isle Wellbeing Group, uh, which has got a proven track record in working with both older people and younger people and intergenerational work. Um, it's already up and running. It could go to scale with the help of this additional funding uh, very quickly. Um, and we felt this was a, the, the most uh, effective use of, of, of this money. The £25,000 for community spaces, um, like a number of other wards in Highland Council, we're going to um, um, delegate the, the um, money to the council's amenities team uh, in order to, um, to, to, to basically keep play parks open um, and to service them and to replace equipment and to replace the bark which often gets um, um, worn out, um, gets scattered as a result of which the play parks are closed. Um, there is additional money for this work but um, it's never going to be enough to, um, to, to, to satisfy the need so we felt this was an appropriate use of the funds particularly because uh, these play parks are um, of great value uh, in, in, this, in this time of COVID. It gets people out and it gets them playing uh, in a safe environment. Uh, the £25,000 to establish a grant fund, it, we're going to establish a grant fund to, for investment in community-led projects to address the four harms of COVID. And details of that will be forthcoming and it will be possible for community groups to apply for that funding which through the usual um, uh, war discretionary fund process and the fourth one is the thirty thousand pounds for sustainable economic recovery and that's to address how the pandemic has, has impacted on economic recovery including tourism training and employment um, we're going to consider this further and a, um, a, a, a proposal will be considered at the next meeting of the area committee in February. That is what we are proposing members. Uh, can I just get your agreement that these recommendations are, are, are forwarded? Are agreed to. Fine, fine. Yeah, fine by me, Gordon. Fine by you. Okay. Okay with you, Jennifer. Fine by me, hey, Gordon. Okay, fine thanks very me. much indeed. Right, thank you. Um, right, now we turn to the um, common good funds. Di, would you like to pick up the reins at this point? Good afternoon, members. Uh, the Promerty Common Good Fund Quarter 2 Monitoring Report. Members have the uh, Quarter 2 Monitoring Report in front of them, along with the appendix showing the monies and the income less expenditure. Um, I expect to come in on, on budget um, and the extra income that we've still got to take in should show within the next two quarters. So, um, 
I just ask members to scrutinise and note the quarter two monitoring statement for the Cromarty Common Good Fund. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fine, that? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, Jennifer said okay as well. <laughs> right. Fine. Um, the, Sorry, I'm on two phones. <laughs> yes. Um, the Fortress was Marky Common Good Quarter Two Monitoring Report is is in front of you. Um, this shows the financial statement for Quarter Two. And again, it's proposed that we come in on budget in that um, common good fund. Also note that the fund's income that still has to come in will show in quarter three and four. Invoices have already been sent, but they're not showing in the accounts yet. So it's just asking members to scrutinise and note the quarter two monitoring statement for Fortress and Rosemarkey Common Good. Thank you. Any questions about that, members? No, that's fine by me. Okay, and, and by me. No questions, thank you. Okay, thank you. Agreed. Thank you, Di. The next uh, agenda item is the Blackout Housing Revenue Account Capital Programme. Um, just inviting you. Um, One moment, please. I'm just. This is Izzy McKeever. Izzy, yes. Um, she should just be coming in now. Sorry about the delay. I've got phones in one hand and <laughs> reports yes, in well, the other and Teams. Well, <laughs> thank you for coping with the communications challenges. <laughs> it's worked out remarkably well, all the things that did. <laughs> Is he uh, joining us any second now? Right, fine. Just, Is it just you that can hear me, Diane? Uh, no, Jennifer. Hello, Izzy. I think we can see your you can see your name up now. Hello. Uh, hello, Chair. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Uh, Right, you're going to present the uh, capital housing capital report or the housing revenue account capital program, I should say. Right, Ca carry on. Thank you, members, for this opportunity to present this paper today. Um, this has been the first opportunity to bring the capital program for this year to committee. So I'd just like to highlight a couple of items. Um, Section 5 outlines the principles that are followed in putting the programme together and the resources available, available to the area. And then Appendix 1 outlines the programme itself. I'm happy to take any questions um, on this, Chair. Thank you, Izzy. We have um, had quite a lot of contact, not with you, I think, but with, but with one of your colleagues on this. And I think there is general agreement that this is um, a, a practical and acceptable way forward. Um, <laughs> but I will see if any colleagues would like to ask any questions. Craig. Yeah, this is uh, observations. Thank you, Izzy. Um, I know Mark would know that I work extremely closely with Colin Sharp, um, especially on the, uh, the maintenance of our housing stock on the Black Isle. Um, it's on page 91 uh, in the first appendix. What I find difficult, um, and this has been, I've articulated this before, is the cost that Highland Council are implicated with and are liable for are replacement windows and doors in our listed buildings where we have tenants. And I really think the Scottish Government and the uh, historic environment Scotland need to actually wake up. We have a duty of care as an authority to make sure our housing or our houses are wind and waterproof in line with Scottish state standards. And if we are having barriers, financial barriers put in, put in place through no fault of our own, that really needs to be articulated to the Scottish Government to say it's not acceptable. Um, I mean, to have a bill of a pro, well, 270,000 is a significant amount of money for just to replace the windows. 
and I know that Mark will be uh, liaising closely, I, I would hope, with at a ministerial level or actually going through the process to do that. Um, I've articulated this to uh, Scottish Government Finance Minister. We really do need Historic Environment Scotland to actually have a more flexible approach to how we actually make our, our properties wind and water tight in line with standard for the benefit of our tenants. So it's that one. The other one I've been working with with Colin and only this week I've, I've sent out the report a problem uh, link to community councils to have that on their front, front page to their home page so that residents, our residents can report especially housing problems and also a process that our residents need to understand to make sure that they've got the best opportunity to get uh, a problem that they report um, followed up in the in the right manner and that in that starts with a phone call to the service centre or an email to the service centre Mark can and Izzy can correct me but that generates a reference number that then the Colin, Colin and other uh, senior management within the housing repairs team can actually follow up on if there's any slippage in that um, in that repair being resolved. Now one thing that has come to to light is that if a tenant or if anybody rings the service centre because we're coming back off the back of Covid there could be a long wait time and I think we need to and this might is something that we need to progress to a different department to actually have a recording saying a tenant or a, 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 per, a caller to the contact centre is one, two, three, or where they are in the position in the queue, and an indication of how long they're actually going to wait, and or if it or if it may be better to to call back at a less busy time. So there's a, the process there that residents need to understand. And I know sometimes it, it's frustrating because by the time we get involved as councillors, tenants are quite frustrated that they may not have had um, the response that they would have would have liked. And I think we need, we need to try and get the, the process um, out to our tenants in a, in a format that they can understand and why we're actually doing it in the way that we do. And I think that would actually help um, Colin manage or, or other maintenance officers manage their the issues that they they are faced with because the last thing you want is to be coming up to uh, an angry or frustrated tenant when we could have had an earlier interaction to get a better result for them. So I think okay. I've, I've said what I needed to there. Thank you very much, uh, Craig. Yeah, um, Mark, would you like to take on the question of um, windows and conservation areas first? Yep. So uh, thanks. Uh, Brought the right in his observations. Um, the challenge with uh, listed buildings is that sometimes there are uh, design and appearance and criteria that are applied to us, um, which can end up making individual building components that much more expensive than for, say, a bog standard council house, for want of a better way of describing it. Now, um, there are challenges in relation to that in terms of listed buildings very occasionally. Uh, access to funding may or may not be available either through Scottish Government or by uh, other uh, sources, but where it isn't available, if we take that scenario, which is just the easiest to explain, um, where there is no other source of funding available, that doesn't remove the statutory obligation on the Council to make sure that the buildings are compliant with the uh, minimum standards requirements set out by its Housing Scotland Acts and other legislation, uh, and indeed as expected of us in terms of the Scottish Housing Regulator uh, and in terms of making sure that we are continuing to comply, for example, with the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. So I suppose at the end of the day, uh, if there is no other money available from any other source and there is a requirement to replace windows in a certain way in order to comply with the listed building, then that does fall on us to uh, meet the cost of. Um, now, that doesn't clearly have a, an impact on the Council's general fund because it's HRA funded, so essentially Again, just for brevity, um, HRA money is best thought of as being the money that tenants pay into the pot for rent and is ring fenced for spending on uh, tenant related issues, which are in the main um, 
uh, repair and maintenance of, of housing stock, but there are a range of other activities covered. So um, it is a challenge, um, but it's not one that we can get away with because um, I think, as you were alluding to, Craig, um, you know, the requirement uh, in terms of wind and water type SHQS um, to avoid statutory disrepair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is mandatory. Uh, and from many years of experience, I have often been challenged, not in the council here, I would say, but in other organisations uh, about statutory fitness issues. And you can be um, sued in the civil courts if you don't comply. So it is a challenge. Um, I'm not sure there's any easy answer at this time. Um, <clears throat> I've not mm. as yet been uh, in contact with uh, Scottish Government ministers in the way that you described, although I'm open to considering that and perhaps you could have a further discussion about that um, going forward. What I am looking to do uh, shortly is to do a var variant on the housing stock of the exercise you'd probably be familiar with in relation to non-HRA buildings. So again, Craig, you know, the example being things like Cromartie Court House, et cetera, et cetera, to look at. Um, you know, the historical costs and the future investment requirements and how we can go about procuring them in a more efficient and effective way. And I suspect as part of doing that, uh, it will then help me to be able to clarify exactly how many listed buildings we do have that are a challenge across our stock. I seem to remember, uh, and this could be completely wrong, so please don't quote me as chapter and verse in this, but I think something in the order of 70 or 80 buildings across the HRA stock are uh, have listed uh, building consent. And so as part of that process uh, of looking into uh, how we uh, invest in our housing stock going forward, um, then I suspect that will help to clarify, at least in my mind, the size and scope of the problem and the likely bills attached to it. And that then would enable us to have that informed discussion uh, with the Scottish Government, because I can't imagine we'll be the only people uh, across uh, the authorities that have retained stock that will have a similar uh, uh, challenge. I mean, uh, Mark, I think, I think the point is this, that... Uh, out of £333,000 of HRA revenue, 270000 is going on doors and windows uh, in a conservation area. Now, if it were not in a conservation area, it's probably fair to say you, that might cost £140,000 um, rather than 270000 So there'd be £130,000 for other things. Um, and I think Craig's point is, why should we pay for this extra stuff? You could, you could make the windows and doors perfectly acceptable, watertight, and all the rest of it, but uh, they wouldn't be appropriate for the particular kind of building. And so the aesthetic um, added value should perhaps be paid for by an outside um, funding source. I think that's the real point. I mean, is there any precedent for doing this? Because it's it, it's an interesting one. It, it really hugely impacts on the amount of money we have to spend out of a very limited pot. I'm sympathetic to the point made. Um, clearly, there's, a, there's an opportunity cost for spending uh, uh, more money on a particular type of road than otherwise would be the case. I don't know. Um, is it, do you know roughly how many units are covered by that spend? The entire contract represents 19 properties, of which that there's eight in Marine Terrace and Cromarty, so eight listed ones. So, so, so £270,000 have been spent on eight properties, is that right? To no, um, oh. on 19 altogether. 19. There, okay. There's um, 11 properties in um, Gowan's Place, and Och is also part of the contract. Right, OK, I'm with you. Right, fine. So I suppose uh, the question that's being asked is, is sorry, Gordon, um, is, is there a disproportionate cost impact on the... Yeah, exactly. Listed, exactly. That's, that's, non -listed. that's what it comes down to, isn't it? Mm. Are you able to advise us on that, Izzy? Yes, the listed ones are definitely a lot more expensive to do than the non-listed. Um, we have, at the moment, I've, I spoke to the architect today, um, so at the moment it's a possibility it will have to actually go to a joiner's firm instead of um, likes of Cairngorm or Norscot in order to complete that. We've also got the additional the, the time implications that it takes as well, the additional minimum of eight weeks yeah. for it to go to planning consent. Yeah. I think mm. it strikes me there's a strategic piece to be done here. Uh, go yeah. on and yeah. maybe say when he when he comes in in a second uh, across the piece of all the housing stock that we have and the stuff that is listed to look at, for example, by building component, what the cost differential is, you know, i.e. standard mm. price of mm. components as opposed to additional costs incurred through a building being listed and the particular requirements that are placed on us as a consequence of that. And then to use that as the basis for 
conversation with colleagues elsewhere across Scotland who have listed stock uh, to build that picture pursuant to having a discussion uh, with the Scottish Government. Uh, I don't want to sound overly cynical, I'm not allowed to be political, as you know, as a politically restricted officer, but I doubt they're going to want to volunteer uh, to uh, pay additional monies uh, to us at a government level. It's certainly not been the case, generally speaking, uh, in the past. In the main, they will say that, that is the, that's the price you pay for having a listed building. Uh, you still have yeah. your obligations. But it's worth asking. It's definitely I worth mean, having. It'd be worth asking Edinburgh, for instance. They must have a number of properties in this category, I thought. Yeah. Uh, Craig, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's 72 properties because I asked the question of full council. So I just did uh, a rough rule of thumb 100,000 100, per property. Some will be more, some will be less, and that'll give you a rough rule of thumb. And um, housing chair said that in my supplementary that he would be looking to bring uh, a comprehensive report back to the the housing and property committee so that will be landing on your desk and you'll be so pleased mark <laughs> i guess i suppose it's got to be done anyway so yeah. um i don't have any problem with putting it together no. on that basis but um uh, don't expect it in december's committee i suppose it's no I, 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 I fully um i fully agree with that it, it's going to be early in the new year uh, just because of what it is, it's going to be a huge amount of work, but it's something as you, as you, I can really agree with that we need to get a handle on. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Craig, and uh, thank you, Mark, uh, thank you, Izzy. Um, no, no further comments on this report. Are we the happy? Only, the only one was the. Um, on the service centre, how how tenants? Oh, the interact. service centre. Yes, that's right. The service centre. If we can give tenants or anybody actually ringing the service centre a rough idea of how long they're going to wait, where they're in, where they're in the queue, or the option to to call back at a later date. I think that is that's just going back from my um, working experience as being in a in a call centre for a number of years. That was always... okay. Thanks. I'm happy to take my way and uh, have that raised, but. Um relevant colleagues that are responsible for that. I think you make a good point, Craig, the technology's there, so it's just a matter of uh, finding some cash to invest in it, I suspect. Um, but I'll certainly have that conversation. It's a good idea. OK, thank you, members. Uh, we've been asked to note the allocation of resources to the Black Isle area set out in 5.5, note the guidance investment priority set out in 5.2, Agree to the proposed one year HRA capital programme for Black Isle 2021 to 22, as set out in Appendix 1. And note the updates on the housing revenue account capital programme will continue to be provided through ward briefings and at future local committees as requested by local members, in addition to reporting to Housing and Property Committee. Are you happy with all of that? OK, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you very much indeed. OK, where are we? Um, right, sorry, I, I, I've lost my... Uh, I'll just go back to my agenda. I think we're just about there, aren't we? Uh, right, let's just see. That was the last one on the agenda. That was the last one. <laughs> OK, fine. Uh, yes, it was indeed. Minutes, well, minutes have been agreed in any case, so that's fine. Right. Um, Di, keep me right here. Is there anything else I should be talking about? I don't think so. I think that's you completed the agenda. OK, thank you. Well, thank you all very much indeed. Um, it's been a, it's been an interesting um, morning. And I think that the if I could just reiterate the pre-meeting that we had with the committee councils on the Inner Murray Firth Local Development Plan proposals, I think was, was really valuable and, and helpful to us. Um, and I'm hoping that this pattern will be continued and indeed will be strengthened in a future area committee meeting. So I'm looking forward to having discussions with you, Di, and Dot and others about how we can we can make this work, which begin in fact next Monday, uh, Monday at 10 o'clock in the morning, I think, is that right? Where there's a, a special ward meeting which is going to look into the items which community councils and other community groups might want to bring to the February meeting. So we will, some of us at least, will, will be um, at that meeting. Until then, thank you all very much indeed, um, and uh, good afternoon. <laughs>